So, uh, hello everyone, I am Julien Pivoto, uh, I work at Enrich, so we are, do open source consulting and actually that's why I'm there because uh, I do care about uh, sharing, I care about open source, I care about uh, reusability. So, uh, this talk will be about puppet modules, so basically what's happened in the past is that you have a puppet module with one people who makes it, who he knows how it works, uh, he wants to open source it, so we put it on GitHub, and it works really well, and manages that repository. But then for some reason, that guy just disappeared, he's silk, is ill, he changed job, he was fired, I don't know. But at the end, you have just zero contributor to that puppet module, you have no one that's actually working on it anymore, and the module is just standing uh, on GitHub, and no one is actually doing anything with that. You have more and more issues, more and more pull requests, but they just stay there, they're just creating a huge traffic jam and no one is never going to merge them because there was only one guy who was in charge of that module. But yeah, it's GitHub so you can fork it. You can create your own forks, fix your works, but then which fork should you start using? Because uh, it's not obvious to see exactly which one will be supported by the community, which one will have uh, multiple contributors, all of that thing is not easy. Also, when you don't touch a, a Puppet module or when you uh, just put the module on GitHub, the continuous integration stuff will break because Ruby games updates because all the, st all the stuff around the module just, just changes. So to work around that problem, we have created a uh, Vox Populi inside uh, the Puppet community. Uh, and Vox Populi is trying to solve all those problems of having people who, are, who act like uh, bottlenecks and that slow down the work. So we use Puppet, we uh, only do Puppet modules and stuff on Puppet. We have some uh, Prometheus and Grafana stuff, we have some other stuff, but we do mainly Puppet. Uh, puppet modules, we have uh, R10K also, we have lots of uh, stuff on Puppet. Puppet is the main focus. Uh, we are a community, it means that uh, we are uh, not like 10 people in our in our garage, no, we are like uh, 100 people uh, playing together around those stuff. We want to have fun. We want to uh, we want to just act together. And yeah, we are really a modern community. We are a team because we do work together. So even if we don't, we are not at the same company. We are not at the same. Uh, we don't have the same focus all the time. But we are experts in our area, and we just want to share and reuse everything that we do using Puppet, and we want to improve the sales of the community. So we can share with you. We share with you know, ourselves. We share the expertise. We share the time, and that's really really great. Um, so. The way we do this is uh, we mainly welcome the work that has already been done by other people and at the moment they say, oh, I don't want to maintain this or I want to, uh, I cannot do it anymore. And then we just say, okay, provide us your module and we will actually fix it, we will work on it, we will continue uh, to maintain it. So that's actually great because people can just I mean, once, once we have the module, you don't need to care about, okay, what will happen to the module, what will, uh, we will maintain it, because there will be a lot of people who will just do that. And just because we are a community, we also ensure that uh, continuity over time, which means that uh, even if a module does not get new features all the time, we will uh, try to ensure that it's still maintained and that we sometimes make new releases to uh, make it work with the latest Puppet version, for example. Uh, regarding also the continuous integration, we to take care about the test, we try to always have them green, even if the outside world is changing, we want uh, you to be able to open a pull request at each time, uh, each time of uh, when you wish. We do this by automating as much as we can, so all the Travis configuration, all the, the release process, uh, the releasing to the Puppet Forge, all of that is uh, automated. We are not busy automating uh, the, GitLabs, uh, the GitHub change logs also. Uh, we also have rules, which means that we are a community, but we have like a code of conduct, we have uh, governance, we have security, uh, security rules, we have all that kind of stuff in place, so we are not, not just like uh, 100 people, we really have uh, a lot of rules to ensure that the community is still welcoming and can just welcome anyone and anyone feels confident and anyone feels welcome in the community. Um, so we are Vox Populi, so find us, we have some puppet like this, uh, we can give you some if you want, uh, just 
to talk to us, see how we fix all those problems, always about automation, about Puppet, anything that you want. Uh, you are there for you and there are a lot of us just here uh, at Config Management Camp today, tomorrow and Wednesday. So you can find us on the GitHub, we also have an IRC channel, we also have a, a mailing list and we have some documentation if you want to give us a Puppet module and if you find a security bug in your products. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So yeah, hi, my name is Mo, and I'm here to talk to you about hardware. Um, I mean, most of you have seen something like that. Most places have a spreadsheet that you know keeps track of your servers. Uh, it was the same for, for us, and I'll start out with a confession. I do like working with hardware, most of the time anyway. Uh, and the team I've been working with for the last three years does a lot of that. So we've been thinking quite a lot, so how can we work with hardware efficiently? Um, well, we thought about it and we came to the conclusion what we actually wanted was a proper source of truth, something that tells us what reality looks like. So um, obviously not, not spreadsheets. So what is truth uh, exactly? Well, it's quite philosophical. But in uh, the context of a data center, it's information based on reality. Uh, why do we care? Well, because we can base our decisions on it, and uh, correct information gives us the ability to automate those decisions. False decision, uh, false truths, uh, I mean, you've seen the news, it's dangerous, you unplug the wrong cable, uh, you shut down the wrong server, and stuff breaks. So, but you don't want half. What's the next problem? Well, truth changes quite a lot. You change servers, you move them around, you switch switches, you remove stuff. So it keeps changing. So how do you keep track of that? Well, not by trying to update the spreadsheet manually, because you know humans are terrible at doing stuff like that uh, repeatedly. So we decided instead to just automate everything uh, and uh, instead of you know trying to keep track of all the changes let's just uh, let the service do it for us um, yes can't remember what else I wanted to say oh yes hardware of course breaks and needs maintenance maintenance so you need to be able to uh, live with any server just disappearing at any point uh, and you don't want to care about one piece of metal of which John already touched this morning. And you might know that it can take quite a while to replace broken parts. Uh, maybe the disk you, you need is just not available in Europe at the moment. So we usually figure that it can take uh, up to a week until one piece of hardware is back online. So we decided not to care and not alert on hardware at all and just, you know, I mean, that led us also to the conclusion that, let's see, we don't want to allow any pets in the data center. Pets being machines that depend on a single piece, uh, single piece of hardware and, uh, or the data on a single piece of hardware. So where do you put pets in reality? Well, if you really have a service that is not redundant in any anyway. Put them in a VMware cluster or something like that with the shared storage. That's your best bet of having it up and running. Uh, that's at least our conclusion. And you want to enable the teams you're working with to, to actually take care of their stuff and own their decisions and be in control of their changes. Like Hannah told us earlier today, we wanted to take ourselves out of the equation completely. So we decided to build something we called SOCA test, source of configuration racks and totally every system. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And um, so what does SOCA test do? Well, it is an automated inventory. The only thing we do is we put a piece of hardware in the data center, we switch it on, and then we hopefully don't have to do anything manually until we throw it out. 
Uh, it's API-based, and the teams can provision and manage their piece of pieces of hardware exactly as they want to. It keeps track of changes. So every change you make is documented. You can always go back and div the changes to the last thing. You always have a log on why things have been done. So there's a downside to dealing with hardware. Uh, you may have seen some of those things. It's so quite horrible to work with uh, some of the tools that the vendors give you. Uh, so that's also one of the reasons why this is not open source yet. We had to take a sh few shortcuts to get it working. So right now it would possibly not work in anything else than our environment. But we're working on it soon. Um, and unfortunately, I won't be part of that anymore because I decided to switch jobs. So I wanted to take the opportunity to thank everybody involved in this and hope they keep on going. And I'm looking forward to contributing to it. And if you are interested in hardware, they're looking for a replacement for me. So thank you very much. So good morning and welcome everyone to my talk about hackathons. My name is Michael and I work for a company called Bosch, which you might all know from parts in your car. So what many people don't know that besides making car parts, Bosch has a few thousand people involved in IT stuff. And our team, for example, is building parts of the so-called Bosch IoT cloud. We try to provide cloud service to our colleagues and to other projects at Bosch. One of our recent tasks was to think about how to provide Jenkins as a build server in a, as a, ho a hosted cloud service within our cloud. And therefore we needed a lot of expertise from different people because our team was not very familiar with the technology involved in that. So um, what we found out, that as with every big company, you have the experts, but they are well separated in separate silos. And it was quite hard to find them. Once we found them, we arranged many, many, many meetings and we got together most of the people we needed. But after a while, we figured out that besides a lot of PowerPoint slides and many more open questions and a few basic ideas, we were not even able to answer the question whether our ideas are technical feasible or not. So after a while, we moved away from this mode of collaboration and thought, okay, let's simply have a hackathon and tackle the main questions we have in our ideas or our solutions. So the rest of the talk will be about lessons learned, how we uh, run a successful hackathon within a big enterprise. So first and most important for a hackathon, set a feasible goal. Uh, the goal should fit within your time frame that you have in the hackathon and it should also attract people to spend uh, their precious time attending your hackathon and working with you. In order to achieve the goal, it's very important to define a proper scope. So think about what should be in the hackathon and what should be out of the scope of the hackathon. Especially do not gold plate anything and think carefully about what you need all the people for and focus on those tasks. A second thing we figured out that it's very important to anticipate technical blockers up front. So what might block people a long time without generating any uh, useful results. And for those blockers, try to hire external uh, specialists or experts. In our case, we had some people from CloudBees for the Jenkins part, some people from Docker for Docker, and some people from Pivotal for the Cloud Foundry part. And I would say it was one of the main success factors for uh, our hackathon. Besides, you should of course provide a proper space. Think about a big room where all the people can work together, but also think about small rooms where people can focus in small groups and, and work concentrated. Um, do not forget to organize all the other tools and prerequisites that you probably need. Most of all, Wi-Fi. Um, software that you probably need, whiteboard. Uh, we, for example, had a sandbox on AWS that we destroyed and recreated several times during the hackathon because we could not work on production, of course. Before you start hacking, 
provide a proper introduction. Tell the people what you want to achieve and let them commit upon the goals. Also introduce the experts and their field of knowledge so that people can talk to them whenever something doesn't work or they need help. I think it's very important that you track your work even if you only work for two days. So set up a small Kanban board, show what to-dos there are, prioritize them, show what's ongoing, show what needs review, and celebrate everything that's finally done. If you want to produce sustainable work, think about documentation. Provide a few snippets of README how to set up your code, provide a few basic diagrams that show how your main ideas work, put them into the repository and share them with others. Otherwise, your results might get lost. Most important, have some party. That starts with the lunch break that you should have between hacking, yeah, like you said, a pause now and then. <laughs> but also think about going to a bar in the evening and have some social events. Remember, a goal of your hackathon should be to tear down silos, so bring the people to socialize. Gather some feedback afterwards. What went good? What went bad? What can we do better next time? Did the hackathon um, meet the expectations of the attendees and make it possible to to bring the people to give you feedback. And talk about it in your company. For example, we have kind of a Bosch internal Facebook and we set up an article on it, like a blog post. We shared the source code repositories, we shared the documentation, and we also shared what went good and what went bad. So I'm sure you want to know how things ended. Um, we did much more than we ever thought within two days. So we provided Jenkins in the cloud master and scalable cloud uh, uh, Docker-based agents. And we also provided a service broker. So it was far more than we ever expected. The hackathon became a success story at Bosch. And there were other projects that followed us. And in the meantime, we now and then have hackathons whenever we need to tackle some technical risks. So I hope you learned something. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Show 42 examples. Yes. <laughs> so here we are. This was supposed to be a live demonstration, but at night it is a night, so it will be a bunch of a very boring and long slides. <laughs> Hope you cope with them. <laughs> this is going to introduce the, a tiny puppet. I talked about this last year. Now there are some improvements. Tiny puppet needs puppet. You can install puppet with just this line. A who get to an URL with a redirector to a script which installs Puppet in any Linux distribution or macOS and future other operating systems. If you don't like to pipe the internet to your shell, you can get the code of this script to install Puppet directly at that URL. So if you don't trust me, check it out. Anyway, this is a script to install just Puppet. Once you have Puppet, you can install Tiny Puppet. It's a model you can get from the Forge, you can install from the, tiny, from the command line, and with these commands, you can also start to use it as a command line tool. If you want to use it also inside Puppet modules, in Puppet file, you have the usual references. How does it work? Well, command line, tp install, name of application, it installs this application on any supported operating system. It manages uh, dependencies, uh, repositories, uh, it finds the right name of the application for the right operating system. Uh, support is for most of the Linux distributions. For some of them, uh, we just need some missing data about uh, package names or things like that. There is the possibility to work on Solari, BSD, Darwin, but still a lot of data is missing, uh, and Windows is still a work in progress. So the idea is to make something that is able to install applications like this with just one command. Wherever you are, one command, and this application is installed most of the times. Um, if something is not working, most of the times it's also a matter of missing data. So all the application data is uh, placed in a module which is called tiny, puppet, uh, tiny data. And in this module, it's quite easy to add data for new operating systems or for new applications and to fix eventually wrong data. You can use Tiny Puppet also to test if an application has been installed uh, correctly on your system. TP test, name of application or just TP test, shows all the installed applications with Tiny Puppet and their status. So you can use this in also in continuous automation, uh, continuous integration pipelines, in testing, and so on. Similar TP log to see the logs of the installed application. TP log without any 
argument shows all the known logs of all your system of application managed by TP. Uh, you can, of course, also add install applications. You can use TP list to see the available application you can install. Currently, we have about 150 applications, but it's very easy to add uh, new ones. The idea is this is a tool you can work uh, with uh, in the command line to help you with normal operating systems activities, but you can also, and mostly, you use it in Puppet manifests. So, for example, to install an application like Postgres, this is the command. Actually, all these parameters are optional. You just, uh, these are the defaults. You can uh, just specify them if you want. Same thing, you can manage the configuration files of an application and let a tiny puppet manage all the dependencies, uh, service restarts, uh, uh, paths of files, and so on. Again, a lot of parameters for a uh, defined like tpconf, you can choose what you to use. You can uh, use also TP test to write um, custom tests uh, um, for your application. So eventually you can uh, your, write your own scripts to test your applications and use TP test to test them. There are quite uh, some easy to do acceptance tests may, based on Vagrant where we install and install applications in a um, scripted way and it is quite easy to basically to verify if a tiny puppet is uh, supporting and working for specific applications. We said everything is inside the tiny data. Tiny data is a module. Basically, for each uh, application managed, there is a sort of uh, configuration file Hira, called hira.yaml, even if Hira is not used, sorry. The structure, anyway, is similar to Hira and uh, specifies where to look for the data for that specific application for different operating systems. The data is something like this. For each application is defined in name of packages, name of paths of files, and so on. All this data can be overridden in a hierarchical way according to the operating systems which is behind. Where you can use tiny puppet? Well, typically in your profiles in puppet, when you know exactly how to configure an application, but you don't want to start to study a new module and insert it, implement it, manage dependencies and so on. You just use tiny puppet, install it, and so on. You can use it also in local component modules. And if you want, you can use it in a command line for quickly debugging uh, things that, that go wrong, to, for quickly understanding if everything is going fine on a system, and so on. So the idea is that uh, there is this du double nature of tiny puppet, can be used by in puppet manifests, in on the command line, abstract operating systems, uh, manage directly applications. That's all. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. You ready? I think so. <laughs> You're as ready as you can be. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to do a small talk about security and configuration management. There was one last year um, from a Puppet user, which was also very good. And basically, I think we should have one every year because this topic is pretty broad. And from what I've seen, there is also a lot we can still do. Um, a common meme is that configuration management is basically kind of the crown jewels in a company. Now, um, I tried to find if there is a definition of what is a crown jewel in IT, and there is actually one um, in a book on secure systems design which says it doesn't even matter if the tool itself is the most critical thing you have, it's even if it, uh, enough if it manages your most critical systems. Um, in our case, we try to automate everything, so that's our goal. And we have a remote control on all the systems for that. We have a tool which allows to adjust anything on the systems, so even if they're secured, we could change that. And we use these tools to build and maintain. So if, we, uh, if anybody steals them from us, they're gone. Um, I made a comparison and checked on the security of the actual crown jewels. So these are 23,000 jewels and quite priceless, which is basically like our system to us. Um, how are they protected? They're in a tower, in a castle, watched by hundreds of cameras, and everything is locked using different keys. So even if you steal a key, you don't, uh, you're not able to take anything away. Um, there's also guards, something we don't really have. And there's different teams of guards who are only for separate areas in that thing. And there's also police, 
and none of them is allowed to touch the crown jewels. There's only one guy who is allowed to do that. But there's 25,000 visitors a day. And the thing is, we actually know we have a problem. There is an NSA slide showing that they have a hobby of hunting sysadmins, and we know they infected like 70,000 systems. Um, I tried to bring the biggest anti-patterns in this whole thing in what we do. Like, I have my laptop here. I take that everywhere I go. I'm not sure if this is the best system to maintain the most critical asset I have. Um, and the other thing is, the biggest anti-pattern I know at all. In some thread models, you hear these stories like, oh, if they have root, you've got other problems anyway. So let's pretend we're in London. There is someone, and he picks up the crown jewels. Are they going to say, oh, well, he has them now. You lost. And no, they're going to stop him. And they're likely going to put him in jail or shoot him or something. Uh, I think we need that approach in our systems too. Um, yeah. Um, the main thing in the first layer is logging and also taking apart your clients and see if somebody sneaked something in there. We should notice after some time, I think. And we also need to make sure that our configuration management systems are the best hardened we have. Because we push our policy to clients, and so if anybody's able to break into that client, my configuration management has to be more secure than that client. And our admin clients are the other thing. So my suggestion is to give up a little bit of convenience and have like a middle ground, and that means, for example, running your uh, admin client on KubesOS so that you actually have a well-protected admin system and you can rest assured that you haven't been hacked there. And we need a bit of work from the vendors, I think. First and foremost, about dependencies. So we have tower balls, we have omnibus installers, and all kinds of things. And these need, be, need to be updated. And as for us running our systems, I think we should get support from the vendors. Like, you don't have to bring the SA Linux policy, but you should, uh, should support the user who uses it. And yeah, I actually worked out a lot of horrible attacks I could think of. And if you're a vendor and you want to know what is the weirdest things, how configuration management could be exploited to annoy people, please ask me. But I don't want to spread that around already. And I want to close with a question. <laughs> who do you serve and who do you trust? So this is about why are we running the system? How do we have to protect our companies? And like, as it's in the last nine, why do we actually trust the systems we manage? Um, I've made a survey, and it will be at the rudder table later. Um, you can pick it up, uh, because I want to uh, get your opinions too. Uh, I have a set of things I know that look dangerous, but I also want to see what you think, and what do you think is well protected, actually, already. Thank you. No. <laughs> you have to anyhow. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, I'm going to tell you something about uh, SHAP 2017 in a hacker camp, uh, which is going to be this summer. First time in this format, so let's see how I'm going to fail. Um, uh, this is a, re a really great camp, of course. Um, and it's a series of hacker events over the past, uh, what is it, 25 years now. Well, the first one that I uh, attended myself was in 97. I was 12, had no idea what I was doing there. Um, but uh, if you really want to see one of those camps, it's just really cool. So um, why? Uh, just go there, meet people, uh, socialize. Uh, well, it's a, vol a full volunteer event, uh, fully driven by the community. So uh, have fun for five days. Um, and, well, we have a theme, uh, conveni uh, convenience and resilience. Um, so we're uh, developing new technologies with uh, all of us uh, to give, uh, and uh, we need more resilience in our lives. 
but that also co um, well comes at the cost. So we uh, have less privacy these days. Uh, we have a nice design, which is based on the free speech flag. Um, so what we did, you have six colors, and um, uh, we t uh, take a, a string, and we split it in six ways uh, to define the colors. And you can do that with several texts. Uh, we have a generator online. You can find it on our wiki. And uh, you can make all your colors that you want and uh, with a certain text. Uh, we have posters. I have them at the coffee area, so uh, you can see how they work out. Now, where is the event? Uh, well, at, that, uh, at the end of the arrow in the Netherlands. Um, and it will actually be in uh, uh, Flevoland, which is actually below uh, sea level. So if you're interested in uh, being five days below sea level, that's the part. Um, so you can see this is the entire uh, yeah, well, island that has been uh, created uh, well in the 30s or something. Um, and yet, if you really want to, you can get there by boat, uh, because uh, we have an harbor and uh, you can dock your boat there as well. Um, and we are at a, a scouting terrain, uh, because the scouts, they uh, have their events as well. And one thing that they didn't have was their own field. And the problem with that is that you have, uh, don't have any infrastructure. So what they did is they uh, bought their own field. Uh, they put in all their infrastructure. Uh, so what you can see here, uh, it's a lot of grass, but beneath the grass we have sewage, we have fiber in the ground, copper, uh, power. Uh, so there's a lot of infrastructure already there. And we have water because, well, it's below sea level and you can actually swim there. Uh, hopefully it will be uh, better weather than uh, when this photo was taken during a summer event that we had there. Um, but then you should even uh, be able to swim. And as you see, uh, saw in the previous picture, we even have an island. So I'm still waiting who will plant their flag on that island the first uh, time. Um, well, at this part of the field, there will be uh, three lecture tents. Uh, and there will be five days of lectures. Um, and well, as you can see here, uh, the uh, right one, uh, that's uh, actually a picture of a piano concert. They actually uh, put a piano on stage, and we have 3,000 hackers who are listening to a live uh, back uh, concert, uh, uh, which was very cool. And well, some photos of uh, awesome retro island uh, from OHM that was four years ago. Um, well, uh, you should see it in uh, reality because uh, the colors and how it all looked in the middle of the night was very cool. And during the day, if you have been partying all night, then you can be in your hammock or uh, in our lounge and just uh, hacking and coding and doing what you normally do. Um, and well, on the top you see all the uh, colors changing, of course. Um, so uh, uh, on the right side you see some uh, soldering and such. Uh, what we have this year, or will have, uh, is a focus on uh, education as well for kids. Uh, so we will have a lot of uh, workshops for kids and a family village. Um, well, the event is 4 to 8 August uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, the ticket shop is open, you can already buy a ticket right now. Um, the CFP is still open, we uh, extended the period and it will close on 31st of March. So if you still have an interesting talk, please submit it. Um, and then, uh, well, I think, uh, I hope to see you in August. Anyhow. <laughs> Hello, uh, my, name, my name is Simon Peters. I'm going to talk about uh, puppetizing pulp repositories. I work for Inuits, which means Chris Buitaert is my boss. And somewhere in 2012, Chris Buitaert made a slide which looked a bit like this. This slide shows uh, how packages should flow between repositories uh, to maintain clean, separate environments and to avoid unprotected sex with the internet. But theory, um, uh, practice is simple in theory, but we, try, we implemented this internally at Inuits and we made a lot of effort to get it going, but in the end not everything is as simple, and this is basically a representation of our pulp server. It eats packages and craps all over the server. <laughs> so the big issue with this is that 
we did everything manually. We created repositories, we, we uh, promoted stuff, we uploaded packages which were locally built sometimes. We manually created mirrors of uh, different stuff. And the worst thing was that nobody was there to clean it up. We had repositories which had like f 500 versions of a single package. Um, we had multiple copies of the same mirror uh, in some places. Because, so we have to automate it. We, got, we wanted to pipettize it, so we opened that can of worms. First, we looked at um, the, um, the command line client for pulp. Uh, which we used before manually, and this is actually a real part of our documentation on how to create a single mirror repository. It's a lot of steps. Um, so maybe the command line tool wasn't that great. We also found out that using the command line tool actually really limits the power of what Pulp can do. Um, so we started looking at the REST API, and we discovered that if we work with native providers against the REST API, we could do resource purging, which is like deleting repositories that are not defined in your Puppet code. So that was a great plus. Now, in order to talk to uh, the REST API, you have, to, of course, to talk JSON, HTTP, and SSL. I don't talk it. Luckily, Ruby does. Um, so with a, a, a couple of simple requires, I was on my way talking to the API, uh, and I wrote a couple of uh, providers and types for Puppet. Uh, the, these are basically very close mirrors of what, what the Pulp API exposes. I mean, it's almost a direct interface to that API. So we ended up, I ended up wrapping around a couple of layers of defined types in Puppet to actually make it useful so that you can say, I want to define a mirror of this repository that's on the internet. But yeah, I, an issue was naming things, especially the composite name var stuff in Puppet, which is something very special that I needed for this, uh, was buggy. The OpenStack people actually already had solved that, and I took just their fix, and I shamelessly copy-pasted it. But then to re actually speed up the running of the Puppet run, we had to reduce the number of API calls, because in the beginning, I was calling the API multiple times, so I needed caching of those results. I also needed to compare uh, nested configuration hashes that are assigned to those objects and update them correctly when some nested parameter uh, gets changed. Also, uh, not that easy part was how, to, how do you configure authentication to um, to, uh, to your API. So we actually just, from Puppet, already write a file and then read it from the, uh, from the providers. So a big disclaimer, actually, I'm not a Ruby developer, yet I still wrote all that, all that stuff. It's probably not the greatest stuff, but I'm going to publish it, and I hope that everybody and uh, other people can help clean it up and get it in integrated with the existing modules. Um, so. Um, I hope also that other people don't, who don't know P uh, Ruby but use Puppet uh, don't, uh, can get a, a bit of a boost to actually write native resources and, and providers. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> also, this talk was, was brought to you by procrastination, beer, a fever, and paracetamol. <laughs> <laughs>